Okay, looks like everybody has joined the breakout room except Mohammed. Darn. I'm going to move him to room two. Mm hmm. Uh, that this morning just looking for freshness dates on old food cartons uh, and discovered that on a um, pasta uh, thing there's a little round dot that if it pops up it's gone bad and I found that out um, in an unpleasant way. <laughs> um, but um, today we're finally off leash at school uh, we, we didn't have any communication at all last week Friday they gave us some information on how they want to proceed. And we had some department meetings some um, via uh, teleconference today. So I feel like, well, yeah. um, and I see it as, as really some re real great, exciting new opportunities. That, um, do well to capitalize on. So looking forward to the, the week ahead. Who else has something? I've been cooking a lot. <laughs> Morning, noon and night cooking, doing a lot of yard work. The yard has never looked better uh, in between moments of panic and wondering when the new gloves will arrive to go shopping. But yeah, lots of, lots of online communication. No idea how we're going to transition it from my school. Ditto with you, Ed. Uh, communication was Friday. This is our official spring break. And on Monday, we have a faculty meeting and professional learning community and people who don't even own computers at home, we're all going to pick them up at school. So we'll see how this rolls out. So I'm new to the education game. I was uh, about to start a position as a traveling facilitator here in Los Angeles uh, for after school programs right when uh, LAUSD cut everything. So that position disappeared. And uh, I feel very fortunate to have picked up some freelance um, remote gigs doing video series and social media for a nonprofit. I'm still waiting for those positions to, to begin. So I'm in a limbo period where I'm really just taking it a day at a time and feel very grateful um, to be in a position mentally to appreciate and enjoy every day as it's coming. Um, but I'm finding myself kind of stuck uh, with and around other people's chaos. I have like my, my partner is in healthcare. Uh, she's in post-acute care. Ooh. There are no cases of coronavirus in her building, but every day is the ongoing struggle of doing their best to make sure they don't get one case because then with one case, one case comes more and it's, it's been difficult for me to navigate these spaces knowing that I'm kind of in a state of limbo and trying to be as grateful as possible in the, in the process, knowing that I'm also suppressing some of my own emotional chaos, but um, trying to also find more ways to support others in the process. I really love that phrase about sort of way in which there is this sense of the chaos of other, of the people we care about. In, and how we deal with that. My Over the weekend, I learned my best friend um, that her son may have it, and he's in Virginia. And my friend's anxiety and fear, just it wells up, you know, the closer this thing gets to your family, the more it wells up uh, as something out of your control. And, and I, I love that phrase about the kind of chaos that it's like right this close, it's right around us. Uh, so you express that in a really beautiful way. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Barbara, Alex, do you have something to share? And Lauren? Well, I kind of <laughs> don't want to just whine about uh, my situation because it actually sounds pretty good. I've got, my kids are home. 
you know, I don't have anything to worry about. They're just here. They're present. Um, one of the nice things is that they are, you know, vampires. And so they're up playing video games all night. And <laughs> my husband and I are working from home during the day. And shockingly, I, so a friend of mine said something about generosity. She said, be generous in your expectations of others. And I shared that with my husband because um, you know how, I don't know anybody who's in a partnership, you kind of have your buttons that you push and you snipe a little bit. And we've both been trying to be mindful of the fact that we care about the other person more than anybody else on earth. So chances are we're not just deliberately trying to piss each other off. And so we're giving that generosity of assuming the, be the person's best motivations when they're talking, even when our tempers are frayed. And I think that that's been really helpful That's all I got. I can share a, a little bit. Um, I, I, Barb, I, that sounds so familiar <laughs> in, in, in my house right now. We, uh, there's a nursing home a few blocks up the street from where I live. And over the weekend, there were 30 cases of uh, COVID amongst the 23 residents and uh, eight staff or whatever that math is. Um, and that is a little alarming because it was just boom, like right, like in a day, you know, that that testing happened. And, you know, who knows how long it had been there, but testing wasn't available until the weekend. So, and we live in a relatively, I mean, it's not a small town, 80,000, you know, but it it's, yeah, I think Renee, you said as it gets closer to home, uh, like literally geographically closer to home. It's kind of like, uh. and you know, my best friend's daughter was babysitting for one of the staff members all last week. And, you know, and we were over at dinner at their house last Wednesday or last Monday when, you know, a week ago, a lifetime ago when it, when it didn't seem quite as scary. So yeah. And then Jose, what Jose was saying uh, really resonated with me too, because I run a nonprofit filmmaking uh organization from my office and we were just getting ready to gear up for our big film festival in the spring we have a big festival every spring and it's our big money maker and it's our big uh event and you know that's not happening now and that's and and professionally i know we touched on this last week a little bit professionally you know i use that as a basis for a lot of the research that i do at western and without that and I have a sabbatical next year, at least I think I do. I don't even know if our sabbaticals are going to be honored now, you know, and I was going to sift through all the data and this was my, you know, my, my thing. And so, and then I'm thinking, oh my God, what a, I think it was Joyce last week who said like, what a selfish asshole I am for thinking like this. But it's so interesting, all the ripple effects that this is having, you know, for, for days weeks, months, years, maybe, um, you know, my husband and I just created an Excel spreadsheet. He's going to one grocery store. I'm going to another this afternoon. We're going to kind of divide and conquer and see if we can find, you know, not even hoarding, just the things that we're out of right now, you know, so little ripple effects of things, um, is what we're going through now. I kind of hit a psychic wall yesterday. I just laid on the couch yesterday and watched HGTV for like 12 hours. Because, like, give me some hometown, you know? Because <laughs> it, it was all I could do. I just, I didn't grade finals. I didn't grade, you know, this is our spring break. I'm supposed to be grading finals this week. Um, yeah, couldn't do it. Okay, cheers to binge watching. I'm, I, I don't know why I'm doing so much of it, but it's a coping mechanism or dis, dysfunctional coping mechanism. Thanks for that point. We, we haven't heard from Alex yet. Okay, fine. Um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm very new to this. Uh, I guess if I was taking stock right now, which everybody is in this uncharted territory, um, I have a lot of privilege. I work for the University of Rhode Island. Um, I work at the Bay Campus for a facility called the Inner Space Center, and we do like a lot of remote technology, um, remote connection. So like, I have training for this um, and I have like state offered benefits to take advantage of that I can actually telework and I, you know, it was an interesting uh, 
I'm, I feel conflicted because it's both sort of an opportunistic side of myself that says this is sort of where as a service facility at the University of Rhode Island, we can sort of help others create spaces to communicate and to functionally communicate, um, which is exactly what this is. So that's also why I wanted to take part today is because I get to learn about other people that are doing the same thing. I mean, when, when was the last time we all had a chance to actually stop and recognize and sort of take stock, right? You're in a new surrounding. It's like, you know, you sort of open up the forest and you're like looking around for the first time and you're saying, what is actually here? What, where can I actually take steps that are going to benefit me? And where am I going to take steps at? Like there might be a cliff or something like that. Um, but it's a conflicting approach for sure, because you don't know how much, everybody has their own load that they're dealing with right now. Right. And you don't want to add into that. You don't want to sort of offer and, and say, um, here's how we could help. Here's how we could do this for you. Here's how we could do that for you. And I don't even think that's appropriate right now. I think sort of what this is doing and what I've tried to do with the team that I work with at URI is to say, can we take a step back and just figure out what we actually do? Um, what do we want to convey and how can we create spaces for people to, slow down and take stock of what is going on in their own world. So I, I sincerely appreciate being able to be part of this and register for this. Um, it's just a fantastic resource. And I think I just want to do a lot of listening for this process. I just want to sort of figure out where I am, figure out where my team can be and really where my facility is too. Um, it, I mean, personal and professional are at this, they're, they're at the same level right now, right? Like my, I have a, babies and stuff crawling around. You'll probably see them in the back at some point. Um, I love it. And at the same time, I know that it's an extremely privileged situation. So it also makes me sort of take a step back and just say, it's probably a good idea to listen right now. We haven't heard from Mohammed or Michelle yet. If you're unfamiliar with the video chat system, there's a little red microphone in the left corner with a slash through it. If you click on it, you can talk. So it looks like we are um, joined by Frank Romanelli. Frank, can you share a little bit about what uh, this has been like at the feeling level for you the last uh, two or three days? Yeah, not so good the last two or three days, honestly. Um, the loneliness definitely set in. I'm fortunate enough to have somebody here with me. Um, but the idea of not just not being able to, you know, like get in my car and visit a friend or have someone come over or see a neighbor has been really uh, difficult for me. Because that's so against my grain, so it's been a little rough. Um, but I got some exercise yesterday that really makes a difference. Getting outside and getting some air and running around a little bit was a good thing. So I highly recommend it when it gets warm again. <laughs> um, that's about it. That's all I got. Thanks for sharing. You know, I I, I do feel like you know uh, teaching and we it's a it's a social profession like I spend my life interacting with people and it's so weird that I don't I mean that I don't do that anymore I haven't done that and th that's partly why this feels good because I miss it Uh, Michelle and Muhammad, if you can't figure out the mic thing, in the very bottom of your screen, if you tap it, there's a chat function. You could maybe tap in your questions or, or, or thoughts. I'm here. Welcome. No, my uh, video is not working, but uh, I'm here. <laughs> um, I don't know, the last uh, week or so has been interesting. Uh, we're, I work for a public library where we're required to go to work, but we have no public um, coming into the building. Um, a lot of people are trying to work from home, but the librarians can, but our like circulation staff can't. So I don't think it's fair that some of us can work from home while others can't. So I've been trying to go in, but um, working from home today. That's all. 
Wow, thanks for sharing. Complicated uh, power politics and decisions made by, I got a phone call or I got an email from a, a, a librarian in, I don't know, Michigan or Ohio, who said her school district had a mandatory use of Zoom. They required that the teachers use Zoom. And so we had a little conversation online about what it feels like to be forced to do something that you don't want to do. Has anybody had that experience where your, your community, your school, your district has m mandated something? I actually, I have a staff meeting at two o'clock today and I'm excited about it because it's nice to see, you know, my colleagues, we had one last Monday, we're a one-to-one -one laptop school, so that makes it easier. Most people have had training on it. I um, have friends who are in other districts who don't have that, and it's been a huge learning curve. Okay, so I have abruptly brought you uh, into the main session. I think I've brought everybody into the main session, but I wanna make sure about that. So people kind of are in the middle of conversation and we are going to do a little bit of reflection as a large group around some of the most meaningful ideas or feelings that got shared. So what I'd like to do is hear from, um, I, I'd like to hear from uh, somebody who can uh, just personally share something important or meaningful or touching or valuable that uh, emerged from your small group dialogue. Who wants to go first? I volunteer, unless you already have one. Go ahead. You're the one. Okay, um, I'll be brief. Um, we had a, a, a wonderful gathering and um, what came out of it is uh, all of us in one way or another addressed uncertainty and the challenges of uncertainty. And uh, Joyce shared um, a document, uh, the Twitter, uh, Statement of principles, and she um, will be sharing it with everyone, uh, but it, it really uh, resonated with everyone in our group. And uh, so that was something that came out of our, our gathering too. So it was a, it was a, a heart, heartfelt uh, connection. Uh, and so glad we had the opportunity to do that. Joyce, can you give us a little preview about what is the state of principles? I can share the sc screen if it, if it helps. Um, let me just load yeah. it. Sure, do yeah. that. Okay, here we go. Um, this is the article in the Chronicle, but it was part of um, a Twitter feed and where the professor shared it. And not only did he share it, he shared it as a Google Doc so that you could edit it and customize it. Um, so this is a professor of, of theology at Chapel Hill. And here is his adjusted syllabus principles Nobody signed up for this, not for the sickness, not for the social distancing, not for the sudden end to our collective lives together on campus. And, and then I'm, I'm not gonna read all of this, but the humane is the best option. We cannot just do the same thing online. That means that we're not just doing it, not, not that we're moving from, um, from face to face to online, but even the things we do online may not make sense right now. Um, we will foster intellectual nourishment, social connections and personal accommodation we will remain flexible and adjust to the situation. No one knows where this is going. And you know, I, I, I was struggling for a way to come back from spring break today to address my students. And so when I saw this, it felt, it felt perfect. It felt, it, it, so we, we're doing this where, and I also introduced just for a little levity, the idea of Jimmy Fallon's, um, my, um, my quarantine in six words as a hashtag for them. Um, and so um, I'm getting some very good responses and people are opening up online and then I'm also allowing them to reflect on Flipgrid. So, um, so I'll see, I'll see how that works. This is the first day back. 
Nice. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anybody else want to comment on something that emerged in the um, in the small group dialogue? Give me a give me a thumbs up. Um, yeah, I, Lauren. I, I, I want to just um, acknowledge what. Um, oh my gosh, is it is it Alex? said in our small group, I can't, I'm looking for his picture on the little, uh, yeah, Alex said in the small group about how um, we really are, uh, well, we, I, sh I should speak for myself. I really am in a pretty privileged position um, where I'm not worried yet about my job. I've got, you know, the things I need at home. I, I think, I don't think about that enough sometimes and I need to keep reminding myself you know when I'm feeling inconvenienced or stressed out that that it could be a heck of a lot worse I just have to acknowledge that thank you so much for sharing I'll hear from two more people as you synthesize what happened in your small group discussion ideas that were meaningful to you and then we'll make a transition to talk Sam has something she wants to share with us two more reflections please Joshua I think you're muted. Oh, oh. I just want to acknowledge something that uh, Frank brought into the group, um, which is just acknowledging that the isolation is starting to seep in. And, and I can imagine that that's happening in varying degrees uh, for everybody. But for me, um, yeah, I think balancing the situation with my roommate, where my roommate brought someone over yesterday to help cope with that. And that just left me unsettled because <laughs> that completely contradicts everything that we're supposed to be doing so I, I i recognize that it's something that we're all kind of struggling with in varying degrees um and just because our social lives have been completely disrupted in various ways but uh for me it's definitely trying to find the balance of empathizing with others and also dealing with it on my own thanks for sharing Michelle, uh, who's who's got who's got a uh, an observation about something that emerged in the dialogue that you'd like to share with our whole group? Samantha. Samantha. <laughs> um, so one thing that Michelle actually brought up was this tension between. Um, like trying to monitor or regulate screen time and now being immersed in it and especially at different age groups how that can be really problematic. So we talked a little bit about that and um, I didn't share this with our group but over the weekend I heard an episode of Hidden Brain podcast where they talked about that actually. Um, did anyone else hear that? No I'll put the link in the chat but basically the host was talking about um, thinking more critically about how you're using screen time and if it's whether or not it's good or bad or if it's keeping you from doing something else or if it's helping you do something you couldn't do otherwise. So I thought that was kind of interesting and relevant. Thanks for sharing. So I guess uh, in some ways, I'm really happy to see the great uh, chat happening. And of course, feel free to, you're making new friends, right? This is your small group is our folks. Hopefully you'll come back tomorrow and you'll get a chance to deepen your relationships. But that's what we're doing really. We're making friends here and uh, we're developing our old friendships. Um, but Samantha, you have uh, something uh, that you want to share. It's something about resistance to feedback. Can you say more? Yes, I can say more. Um, and I'll send that link later because I can't look for it and also run with this. So basically last week, um, Renee shared with us some really cool ways to give feedback on um, online basically. She showed um, how in one of her classes, she'd used Video Ant to give feedback for a video presentation, which was awesome. And it really started to make me think about how we can adapt to this learning environment and still give valuable feedback to students. And then I started to think, well, you know, normally I teach in Hong Kong and my colleagues there are really resistant to the idea of giving feedback at all. So every time I try to push it, there are various reasons that they give. So basically what I would, what I would like to do today is kind of open a conversation about, um, about the idea of giving feedback at all and how to adapt to that online. 
So if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna share my screen and just um, share some prompts that um, I've created for our discussion around this. So let me share my screen. So, uh, sorry, so uh, I missed it. You asked the question as a question now? No, yes. she, she's, go, she's about to share her screen. The screen has, oh. I think, the questions, and then we will uh, we'll okay, cool. see them, then we will, uh, we will share. I, I think oh. that's right, right? Are you trying is, to share your screen? I'm trying to share my screen, but now it's saying I have to quit Zoom to change my permission, so. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Okay, so instead of sharing my screen, I will just um, read you <laughs> what I had prepared. So basically, um, the things that I'd like to cover today is like, how do we make the case to our colleagues that feedback is actually valuable and a required part of learning? Um, and then how do we address the barriers to giving feedback? And in my experience, what I've noticed is the barriers tend to be um, a misunderstanding or um, an unawareness of the effectiveness or the role that feedback actually plays in learning. Um, full disclosure, I teach in a journalism department where most people are practitioners rather than educators, so that's a large part of the issue there. Um, but also there's a large fear around conflict that comes from feedback, whether it be from the students or the parents. Um, the educators seem to think sometimes that um, if you give students direct feedback on their work, they're going to meet some resistance or that's going to create conflict. And then finally, um, it's very time consuming, of course, to give feedback. So how can we um, take advantage of some of the tools available to us to make giving feedback to students more effective and more efficient? So I guess, I guess the first question I have is, um, do you guys experience that same resistance either in your own work or with your colleagues? Does anyone see any sort of resistance to the idea of giving feedback? I, can, I have a quick question. So by feedback, you mean like comments? Because grades are also feedback, like grades can be considered feedback, but I guess they don't resist the idea of grades. So it's just like giving a grade, but not explaining why. Exactly. That, that's what happens? Yep. Hmm. In Hong Kong. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, I just want to say that I can definitely relate to the uh, anxiety around students' uh, reactions. Um, but on the other hand, I wonder um, why they don't have this anxiety about students' reactions regarding grades, because if students just get a grade but they don't know what happened, um, that creates uncertainty for students, and then also maybe they don't know how to improve whatever they did wrong in ne next time. <clears throat> so yeah, so I'm just I'm I'm wondering how they explain how people who are against feedback as comments, how they explain that part. Yeah, I mean, in Hong Kong, for example, they just kind of want to give the grade and hope that it just floats out there. And if there is a question about the grade, they'll, they'll address it as, as need goes on or like as there's a need to. But yeah, giving, um, so, the kind of detailed feedback that like Renee was showing us last week, I would do that, but then like my fellow TA would not do that. And so it created like a weird dynamic. <laughs> it was really weird. So I, I see in the chat, uh, Kathy and April have interesting points. Can you share those with our whole group, please? Well, I, I teach a course on assessment for special education. And so a lot of times, we talk about assessment versus evaluation because when you're labeling a student, when you're diagnosing, you really do evaluate. I mean, there's a bar and you evaluate and you're either over the bar or under the bar. And that's a very different concept than assessment or feedback. But I think for many people, it's just get me to the end. What's the done deal? Okay, moving on to the next. So I, I find this an interesting discussion because assessment, evaluation, feedback can be interchangeable, but somebody said it's, it's the purpose. Somebody right at the start said um, it's the purpose, really. And you're right when you say two people use the same word and have two completely different meet purposes and meanings in how they do it. So, April, 
April, and then uh, Jane. April, unmute your microphone. April. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, sure. Sorry. Um, about that. In order for the feedback to actually be uh, effective, so that the the learners can can hear hear, uh, there needs to be some kind of delivery process that opens people up to being able to learn and a, just a grade just a plain old grade uh, a letter or a number is probably not very effective at least it hasn't been in my experience whether i'm receiving them or giving them so i think we're entering a new of uh, a new era of assessment and grading i'm not quite sure what that's looking like other than uh pro projects uh creating creating projects is is how i see that evolving currently nice uh uh pam and and then faith um did you want me to mention what i said in my comments um yeah so i just asked about uh, Sam, since she said that most of her colleagues were journalist professionals, they get feedback all the time, at least they do in this country, via comments on the online, etc. And I'm wondering if because so many people who comment to stories comment in a negative way rather than a positive way, whether they've gotten an attitude that feedback is a negative thing. Um, so it just might be something to explore with them about um, the positive ends of, of feedback. Yeah, that's a great point. And my understanding too, interestingly enough, is that in the newsroom, in local newsrooms in Hong Kong, editors are also reluctant to give their, their journalists feedback, which is crazy. <laughs> so. Um. So it might just be an Asian, I want to say, say this in a stereotypical way, it might just be an Asian thing? It could be, but you know, funnily enough, when I, when I did my master's program at, my, at the same university, all of the instructors are Western, mostly American, and I never got any feedback on any of my writing or, or work either. So yeah, I don't know. I think there's um, definitely find... cultural aspects though to the stuff, like you're talking about it, but I think that you know, other, certainly other countries and other cultures experience, you know, there's differences in how you give criticism or feedback or whatever. I mean, like, you know, if you're in England, everybody's always saying, sorry, sorry, you know, and everything has to be sandwiched in there with stuff like that. So I think it's important, especially now that we have, like, just even within this group, I think we have a pretty diverse group to think about like what is okay in the culture that you're most comfortable moving around in and saying things might be different from the person you're delivering it to and, and vice versa. And so how they receive it is, could be also very different. Key insight, Jane. Um, yeah, I think that uh, this is part of that process of, of, of going to, to education whereby you, and, and why many people really eschew it and don't necessarily um, take to it well, um, because it does mean putting yourself on the line for evaluation. Um, as a former practicing journalist, as well as a student who has gone through a number of levels of, of education, um, it can be unnerving to have someone evaluate your work and to tell you where you may have not quite um, hit the mark or where you might need to improve. Um, that being said, for my students, I like the idea of, um, of the summative and the formative ideas and the distinction. Um, summative is sort of like, okay, well, this is what you did and here's your evaluation, um, whereby, you know, if I can give students an opportunity to hit a certain bar and they're able to do it, after I've given a rubric and, and, and explained my expectations, I do think that that helps them to be successful. So here are the expectations and here's your grade based on those expectations. Um, but it depends, a lot of times I have classes that have 
um, final, final uh, presentations that are a summative of, of their work in that class for the semester. So then that becomes like, okay, here's what you've done. And then maybe for the next class, here's what you might do. Or if you're presenting at a conference in lieu of, of speaking at a class. So um, that's kind of how I approach it. But I do have that sensitivity and understand that it, it can sometimes be unnerving for students to hear feedback, even here um, in the US. I think it's worth being aware of some patterns in, in the way feedback works. Um, the people who appreciate feedback the most are the people who are most self-confident about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Great writers love great editors, right? And, and um, part of that is because it's a voluntary process that they're engaged in. Um, but uh, we have a contradiction in education, which is that a huge percentage of the time we're dealing with people who are new at whatever it is they're doing. And they're the least likely to want feedback and they're the ones who need it the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we have to figure out ways to kind of make it a team thing instead of uh, I'm the judge, you're the performer yes. thing. Because that's intimidating for people who aren't used to being on stage. I mean, there are people who crave being on stage and love the feedback of audiences. Um, but that's not actually true for most of the population. And, and so it's, it's um, a lot easier to get people in receptive mode if they see it as part of this, we're in this together. And for me to do my job, I have to help you be better. Um, and and so it's judging us both, right? Am I good at giving feedback? And can I help you be better at what you're trying to be better at, what you're trying to master? One of the things I like to do, I like to take the opportunity whenever I can in a class to let them give me feedback on something I've created to kind of model that for them and to show them that I can be vulnerable and receptive to that and and, uh, and that I can separate that from who I am my product is not me um, and, I, and I point all those things out to them but and sometimes the feedbacks really good and whenever I can do it the, the other night Kathy was in my um, business writing class talking about resume writing and she brought up a point um, about something on a resume that you don't need to have on a resume so I brought up my resume and said okay I'm taking that off in front of all of you to see you know <laughs> it, nice. I think it helps. Yeah, I want to um, underscore uh, how um, I don't know. There's something cultural for that I've experienced that that makes it difficult. I um, I made a mistake at my school in the last month. Like I sent out the wrong directions for something that had ripple effects, and I. I publicly took took ownership of that and the number of people who came up to me after and were like I so appreciate you taking ownership of that and I was just thinking like are we we're so used to people just like not taking taking ownership for mistakes and like pretending like they they did they've never done anything wrong and I just I just think that's so sad that the fact that I did a very small version of that was so noteworthy to colleagues but yeah I think modeling taking feedback things is really important I think that's something that has become pretty um, almost seemingly overnight universal for so many many people um, and that's kind of one of the benefits I know this is a this is for no better word a crisis going on right now globally but there are not all things that come out of this will be um, bad and potentially the good things we hope you know will sustain and to the points that a lot of people seem to be making there's just there's it's a further distributed model to go remote right like you can access more perspectives in real time you can you can access more positive perspectives in real time and get feedback in in, in a faster um, method and now all of a sudden Sorry. Um, now all of a sudden there's this creating the space to be vulnerable, to like let your, let other people know. And in times of crisis, right, you get the best and the worst of people. And I think 
as part of this conversation is happening like you get the best of people sometimes and when you're in a remote and virtual world you get to see that so much faster without any of the veneer this is sawyer by the way for anybody who can see um the future why we need to be sort of taking stock of where our society like what are the beasts that we feed right like what an essential question right now like we're seeing some of the beasts that we feed in society be and i'm not an educator by the way i'm somebody who's like an informal educator um but like our healthcare system that's a beast we need to feed right in times of crisis we need to feed those systems we need to make sure we support those systems so social isolation is in essence a support structure for those people. Like farms, you know, other systems like that yeah. wow so much my so much there. Thanks so much for sharing. So much oh, wisdom there. Hi. Joshua, who's who wants to speak? Start I, talking. I, I yeah. can jump in. Um, da, 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 da. I started taking a class through UPenn on blended learning uh, and their approaches to using digital technology in learning environments uh, because it's free and because I have this time on my hands. Um, but they do the thing where they break down behavioral learning, cognitive learning, and then they introduce constructive learning. Uh, and that theory essentially, I'm sure some, most of y'all know, but is creating meaning rather than acquiring it. And they acknowledge that it's the relationship between the learner and their environment where knowledge is created. I'm just gonna read a little piece from the class because it's very pertinent to this conversation about feedback. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Pedagogical approaches such as problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning, and self-directed learning used by educators are all constructivist understandings of learning. In such an environment, learners are encouraged to construct their own understanding and then through social negotiation, validate this new understanding that they develop. So again, it's it's really the learning environment, the classroom, wherever, is where they create their understandings. And I believe that feedback is that crucial component that gives them the, the social validation to say, okay, I'm on to something. And the grade is one way of doing that, but I guess it's ultimately for each educator to decide, is that enough for them to know that this, you're on to something? Or can we acknowledge with words that if you go down this path or if you chew on this a little bit more, you can maybe stumble upon something. But again, I, I, I'm a big, I agree with everybody on uh, really the, the pros on feedback and his role in learning. I'm, I'm noticing the smiles around the room, around the folks who uh, feel empowered by this approach to learning but i'm also really reflective sam in your conversation your your probes have made me start thinking about um this issue of judgment jane in the in the chat said you know inevitably when i respond to work student work it is understood as a judgment right not as not as a way to say here's the meaning i'm making not the way Joshua says it, it should be understood, it's, but it gets understood as a judgment. And sometimes I feel like I have a lot of sympathy for your colleagues because um, the, burden of, the burden of that authority, of standing in that place of authority, ah, fuck it, right? If it's like, I could, I'd give that up in a heartbeat. That's like the thing I'd love to get rid of if I wanted to improve education. Don't make me be the fucking judge. And, and I hate the fact that our system set that up for us to be that way. And maybe we are, maybe it's something we reconsider or reject. And just to bounce off of what I think it was Alex was saying, I think that this sort of going to an online format, at least again, I'm, I'm an eighth grade teacher. Um, has given me the opportunity to sort of reframe what that looks like and, and what feedback can look like and, and the flexibility that's inherent and expected. I'm, I'm clearly going to be flexible towards my students. And one of the first things I said in my video to them was like, 
well, you gotta, you gotta be flexible with me too. <clears throat> but, you know, I mentioned this in the chat. One of the directives we sort of got from our district is <clears throat> no grades while we're away. I, that might change, um, but, but no grades while we're away. So all we're doing is giving feedback. Although the, again, this is only, <laughs> this has been a, just a, a little bit of time. Um, but I, knowing my eighth graders, that's all they want is the grade. They don't, I could spend 25 minutes making beautiful feedback on these great whatevers. They don't read that. They just want, what's the, what's the, what's the grade? So that's, it's been, it's topsy turvy here. Can I pitch in there? Because I feel like that's where the opportunity is because like to everyone's point, feedback, authentic feedback is what actually matters. Um, and exactly, so exactly. Figuring out uh, as teachers, as educators, how to position that with the students as the priority um, for them to be thinking about. Um, I mean, I think these types of voluntary learning experiences are kind of exciting because the incentive should just be around the learning. And so how do we, how do we at this time, this is what I'm trying to figure out, how do we construct experiences and share them with students that are authentic in nature? Um, and so that's something I'm trying to figure out. Thank you so much for sharing. That was actually a really amazing conversation. And in another tradition, so we're experimenting with our traditions, right? Uh, we, today we used the small group discussion followed by a guided uh, facilitation from Sam and a little applause to Sam. Thank you, Sam, for that great, great uh, facilitated discussion. But now we're gonna do two minutes of appreciation. Look around the room and see who you want to appreciate. Two minutes of appreciation as we conclude. I will begin. Ed, I appreciate you because in our small group discussion, you called out the quiet ones and you actually did some informal teaching in the way you helped people like learn to use the Zoom. Ed, I appreciate you. Renee, I just learned in the last few minutes some new strategies for teaching, and I love this one as well. So I really do appreciate you, and um, and I also enjoyed um, just in general really thinking about assessment in uh, in in a new way. Thanks. So thanks everyone. Appreciations. It's your turn. Look around the uh, room. We've got fifty people here. Twenty eight people a, here. I have a twofer. Uh, one, the kind comments you gave was learned from this chat this past week, and I was able to employ it in a chat in the district this week, and it was really a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, I remember hearing one time from an executive who, who got to start a big board meeting when he was just an intern, and he, he was afraid to say anything. And the big CEO called on him, and, and his answer changed the decision of the board. And leaving the meeting, the big CEO said to him, always ask for the quietest person's opinion in the room. Um, and when we can do that in our classes, it's a wonderful thing. And the other, I said it'd be a twofer, the other person I'd like to call out, and actually it was a collective, people talking about um, the, the privilege we have if we're so fortunate to get a paycheck right now. And Alex was just modeling what it's like for so many of our parents uh, and kids that might be taking care of kids. Um, that our expectations need to be dialed down um, so that we're not creating stressors, but we're, we're offering um, um, some respite. Thanks, Ed. Who's next? We have one more. We have one more time for one more appreciation. I want to appreciate Jose. And I want him to say it again, who repeated his name so that we can all learn how to say it correctly. Oh, Sway. And if it's easier for y'all, you can just call me Sway. Sway. <laughs> Sway, you and the 30 plus people who participated in today's um, 
uh, virtually viral hangouts are treasures uh, to me. And uh, we're going to wave goodbye now. Hopefully, you'll be back tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Have a great day. Stay safe. Thanks for participating. Bye now. Thank you.